Are you tired of having to model and remodel your guitars in Fusion 360 only to have the entire timeline break because you just wanted to change one thing? Well, I have been there so many more times than I can count, and I just want to let you know you're not alone. But what if I told you it's actually possible to make an entire parametric guitar, just like my parametric fretboard, where you change a few values and the entire model updates cleanly? Well, not only is it possible, I've officially done it on my Mare design, and I am now releasing Mare version 3 on grabcad.com as this video goes live, and you guys are welcome to go download it. But before that, it took me six months to get to this point. I spent the last six months going down that rabbit hole, banging my head on the keyboard, figuring out what does it take to make a guitar parametric in Fusion 360. And I learned a lot of really important things along the way. Now, I do want to clarify something. This tutorial is not going to be a step by step, you know, do this to get this result, because not only would that video take forever, but also everybody's designs is just a little bit different. And what I do on my design is likely not going to be the same workflow you deploy on your design. So what I think is more important for us to talk about is what was my thought process as I went through this design? Why did I make the decisions that I did? And how can you maybe avoid some of the traps that I fell into so you don't have to learn everything that I did the long way around? So let's just not waste any more time. Let's jump into Fusion and talk about a fully parametric guitar. Right, so jumping right into Fusion, you guys are very familiar with this model. If you've been following my channel, this is my Mare guitar design. And longtime viewers will notice there's quite a few things that have changed on here. I have a through neck design right now, and I've also switched to like an inline um, straight string pull headstock. And right now it's actually set up for multi scale. And that ties right into the parameters that we're going to talk about. So let's go ahead and just jump right into the parameters. Let me show you what this model is capable of for those of you who aren't really familiar with what I'm talking about. And then we'll go ahead and dig into the details and kind of, die, kind of work through this timeline and see what my thought process was as I went through it and the important things you're going to need to keep in mind. So let's go ahead and open up the parameters. Let's get this model visible right here. Now, most of these, if you're already familiar with my parametric fretboard model, this is pretty much straight out of my parametric fretboard model, although there are a few additional extras here. But for example, right now I can add the number of strings. So right now it's set up for a six string. I can change it to a seven string. Not only has it made it wider, it's also added an extra tuner hole and my surfaces have updated. So let me switch that to like an eight string. Same thing. And I can go back. I want to make these in small changes. Go back to seven and go back to six. Now you may notice some of the little appearances on these little stripes in the middle have not quite updated cleanly. Uh, I'll talk about that later, but that's just a minor appearance flaw in this model. I also have string spacing at the nut. So if I want to have a narrower nut, I can go 0.25. Let's look at it from this angle. Or I can do a wider nut like 0.375. Now that's 0.375 is the string to string spacing, not the overall width of the nut. Let's go back to 0.3. I can do the same thing with the bridge, and most of the time you'll just use your bridge, uh, your bridge manufacturer's spec for this. I also have the edge gap, so what is the distance from the string to the edge of the fretboard? So if I show this here, I can go 0.1875, or I can go like 3 millimeter and enter in a metric value. Let's go back to 0.125. We also have obviously our scale lengths. So if we want to have this set up as multi-scale um, or single scale. So I could type in 25.5 and turn this into a single scale guitar. And I could then, you know, update the strings if I want it to be a seven string, etc. Let me go back to six. And I can also change this back to like a multi-scale. So I could go like 23. Now the challenge here is this model does tend to break, as you've noticed right here if I push the parameters too far in one large jump. So I can hit 23 on this model. I just need to make it in smaller, smaller adjustments all at once. So let me go back. Right now we're at 24. Now let's go to, let's say, 23.5. Yep, and then let's go back to 23. And you'll notice that all works. I just can't make that large of a jump all at once. I can also change what fret is vertical. So I could make like the first fret the vertical fret right here, or I could make the 24th. Now, I don't know if this is too large of a jump. Yep, that was too large of a jump. 
So let me back out. Let's go from 7 to 12. 12 to maybe 18. And let's say 18 to 24. And look, that worked. So the last fret on here is actually the vertical fret. So you have a squared end of the fretboard. And the one up front is the one that's most angled. So let me just back out, undo, come back in here. And we also have the fretboard radius at the nut. So I can change what that radius is. I also have the radius at the heel as well. I'm not going to show all of these right now. I also have how thick is the fretboard at the thinnest part at the nut. So if I wanted a thinner fretboard, I could type that in. Or I could go, if I wanted a really thick fretboard, I could do that as well. And just like in my fretboard model, you can change this from through slots to blind slots by using this fret slot offset. Um, one new one that's in this design is I also have a headstock angle. So that is the primary angle of the, of the headstock, the break angle. So right now it's set to 10 degrees. I could change that to, let's say, 5. Or I could change that to 15. And everything in my model is still updating very cleanly. I also have like, how thick do I want this nut to be? This little shelf that I've set up for the nut. So maybe I wanted a thicker nut. I could do like 0.3 and it will basically push that out or I could make it smaller. So that's pretty much how this model works. And it's really, really versatile and allows me basically to have one design that allows me to make a few small changes and I don't have to keep remodeling my guitar over and over. I have one design that works for everything and maybe once I've changed everything, I say, you know, I want to make a dark, uh, that's the wrong one. I want to make a dark guitar with, you know, mahogany, uh, through neck. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stumbling my words. And I want to do something like that. You know, you could totally do that really easily. And again, I'll talk about the through neck uh, decision a little bit later. So let's go ahead and dive into the sketches and dive into my important tips of things I learned on how to make this happen. So the first thing you're going to need to get started is you need, obviously, a parametric fretboard file, like I mentioned at the beginning, because everything in this design is basically based off of the fretboard decisions that you make. And all the rest of the body and the headstock, etc., will adapt to compensate to the layout of the fretboard. So you need to have a parametric fretboard file available. Now, if you don't know how to make that or you don't have the time to work on it, I do have three videos dedicated to that topic alone. I will leave those down in the description below. Or if you don't have the time to sync into it, I do have that model readily available on gravcad.com to download. So that way you can go ahead and get started. The second most important tip is to get your primary sketches out of the way first. So this means your fretboard, which we technically already have since we have the parametric fretboard, your headstock outline, and your body outline. So let me roll my timeline back here, and let me show some of these sketches. So I have my headstock outline, I have my fretboard outline, and I have my body outline. These three sketches are what's driving pretty much the entire design. And if you can draw these in 2D, and have the parameter and sort out the parameters, make them work for these sketches and have everything working correctly, then you know at that point it's actually possible to make the rest of the guitar parametric because every other feature or sketch in this design will be referencing these sketches at almost every single step. So you want to get these rock solid. So for example, if I change my parameters here, change it to a single scale length, my sketches are what's changing and those are driving all of the other features in the design to adapt. So get your first three sketches rock solid, get them working at the parameters, and you know the rest will fall into place. Now, on that note, the next important tip is you want all of your later features. So let me roll the timeline back. You want to reference as early in the timeline as possible. So if I'm projecting in something to create these contours for the body, I want to try to use those early sketches for my reference as much as possible. And the reason for this is because Fusion 360 calculates in a linear fashion, right? It's a single threaded application. So it's going to calculate the timeline in order as it was created. And if every single sketch and feature was dependent on the one that came before it, well, if you break one thing down this chain, then everything else breaks down in the timeline. But by having all of these reference as early on uh, geometry as early on in the timeline as possible 
then you know that if you break one thing, you won't have to go back and fix everything. So again, when you create projections to create your later geometry for, let's say, this, um, this transition for the headstock or the body and the neck, etc., or these contours, you want to try to reference geometry that's available as early in the timeline as possible. So with those tips out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into the body sketch so I can show you some really important things that you're going to want to pay attention to and keep in mind in order to make your body sketch um, compatible and stable with your parametric fretboard model. So let me open up the my body sketch here. And the first thing you might notice, although it might look a little weird because I have a different um, environment set right now. So let me change it back to photo booth. There you go. Sorry for the, the bright flash there. But every single line on here is black. And what that means is that it's fully constrained. I've defined every aspect of what this shape should be. And what that does is it allows me to, let's delete this dimension for a second. I'll talk about it in a moment. And it basically says, hey, I know what this shape should look like. So no matter where I move it, it's not warping. It's not changing shape. It's just moving to the location that I want it to. And so when I actually drew this sketch, I drew it off of my fretboard, you know, way out here got it fully constrained until there was only one constraint left. And that constraint is where does this touch the fretboard? And so then I said, okay, I want it to connect to my fretboard line. And I want that to be a fixed distance from that corner of my fretboard. So I did 1.125. And now I can't move it at all. It's a fixed location. So for example, when I change my fret count, to let's say 22, What's happening is the body sketch is getting pulled, but not distorted, and that's important. It's getting pulled along with the fretboard as the fretboard shortens, but no, no shape on my body changes whatsoever. And let me go back to 24. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here because of the way I laid out the sketches. If I change the string count, for example, the fretboard gets wider, and because I didn't dimension you know exactly how those are supposed to relate i just said hey those are supposed to be coincident with this line technically my horns in this design just get a little bit smaller right the gap between the fretboard and the horn gets a little bit smaller as i increase the string count so if i go back to six there you go you can kind of see what happens so the most important thing is to have a fully constrained sketch and have a fixed point on the fretboard that never moves and allows the fretboard to pull the body with it. So once again, in this design, that was this corner of the horn. It could have been this one in your design. It doesn't really matter. It could be this line right here. It's how do you want that fretboard as you change the scale lengths to, you know, protrude into the body and how do you control that? And so I did it this way, but that's really it. Otherwise, the, the bigger challenge here is if you're using splines, Splines are notoriously hard to constrain. Um, I think if you're trying to build a parametric fretboard model, not fretboard, a parametric guitar model, I think it's really smart to do it all, at least the body sketch, all with arcs and lines. But if you have to use a spline because you just simply can't get the shape you want with arcs and lines, then you're going to have to go through the effort of fully constraining it or locking down the body so that the fretboard pulls with the body rather than the body pulling with the fretboard. Although that gets a little bit more complicated and I wasn't able to get that stable. So again, I would recommend using arcs and lines and fully constraining it and then attaching it to a fixed point on the fretboard. And if you're using splines, go through the, do the exact same thing, fully constrain it as annoying as that might be and find a fixed point and lock it down. So now that we've got the body out of the way, let's talk about the headstock, which is arguably the hardest part of this entire design. Um, but let's go ahead and look at this. So first thing I did was I created a headstock angle sketch. Now this is just a helper sketch that gives me a center line that is a true center line across my entire guitar, but at that angle. So you'll notice, for example, it's not directly in the center of the shape of my headstock. It's just in line with the fretboard and it's set that angle. So if I open that up, all you can see is right here, I have a 10 degree angle. If I open that up, I've got headstock angle, my parameter set up. And I just created a parametric value here that says, hey, take the string count times two, so that way this line is always long enough. 
What that allowed me to do is it allowed me to create a three point plane using the fretboard sketch. So let me hide some of these bodies here and let's show these sketches. So we've got the headstock outline and headstock angle. So there's my angle sketch right here. And that allowed me to create a three point plane between this point, this point, and this point. Because what happens with multi scale, now this is going to get complicated, so I'll just keep it real short. A lot of people have described this better than I have on YouTube. But you have a primary angle right here, and then you have a secondary angle depending on your scale lengths, which is right here. So what happens is, for example, if I switch this to a 25.5, a single scale length, because both of these match, then all I have is one angle. I just have the 10 degree angle, and that's it. But as I change that, and let me bring back the bodies now and show you this. As I change that, and I go back to a multi-scale, what you'll notice is that these lines right here rotated. And let me try to make this a little more extreme so it's a little more obvious. And let's go to 23. The headstock is actually rotating sideways rather than just down and that's because what's happening is you have the primary break angle and you have the secondary break angle so you have a compound angle and so by doing a three-point plane along the center line it allows that plane to be true to the guitar along the center line but allows it to rotate along with the headstock as necessary i know that probably didn't describe it well enough at all but just trust me create a quick little sketch for your headstock angle Create a three point plane between those points, and then you can go ahead and draw your headstock. So let me open up this headstock sketch, and I drew it on that plane. And what I did was, let me hide the body here. I projected in the high E and low E strings. So that way I could generate some pretty close, not perfect, but pretty close to straight string pull. So these are my lines that represent, these blue lines right here represent my theoretical straight string pull. And I use that to define where my first tuner hole and my last tuner hole is going to go. Now, it's not a true straight string pull because these, you know, would have to be tangent to that line rather than that, but the center is pretty close. So, then I used a formula to dimension basically how long that line should be and that automatically sets this angle of this line. So, I did string count, which was in this case six times one inch because that was just a regular value. So I had to convert it to inches. And then I subtracted one inch. So basically, I said, if I have six strings, I want there to be five inches between the first and the last hole. Um, and if I have seven strings, that means it's going to be seven strings minus one inch for the last hole. So that would be six. So if I change this to seven strings, for example, this now changed to six inches. So that basically means I set a distance between each hole, each tuner hole that would theoretically go along here, a distance between the center points as one inch. And that allowed me to have basically a fully constrained little bounding box of which I could design my headstock around. So for example, I made this line parallel to that line, so it, I'd have a nice, you know, even inline tuner setup. And then the rest of it was just trying to find a clean headstock design and then making sure testing at every single stage, testing my parameters and making sure it's still working. So once again, if I come back and I make it back to a single scale length, yes, it's working. And I change it back to 24. Yes, it's working. One last thing on the headstock sketch before we move on is I did actually use splines for these two little wing areas and the reason why i used splines for those areas rather than arcs is because i made this point right here vertical to this point what that allowed me to do is as i change these scale lengths this line will just simply distort into whatever shape it needs to be in order to accommodate my constraints rather than growing in let's say arc size or radius size so if i change this to 23 this line is basically stretching rather than growing in size and making my headstock larger than it needs to be or creating some funky shapes. It's just 
maintaining all the same parameters. It's just stretching to accommodate. So that's why I used uh, control point splines for these two areas. I also used a control point spline for the volute. Um, based on the same things, I just tried to make sure that the tangent point here lined up with the middle line. So that way, no matter what I changed it to, the center of my volute was always in the center of my neck. And keeping those in mind, that was really hard to do, but um, if you're able to get that working with your parameters, then you'll know you'll have a stable headstock all the way down the chain. So with those critical steps out of the way, those are arguably the most important talking points about this entire design. I'm going to kind of try to quickly run through this timeline and maybe stop at a few points to talk about something important that I learned along the way. So I'm going to roll my history back to where we were before, which was the headstock um, sketch. And then the next thing I did was I set up to create my body. Now I already had my body sketch right here. And I had to reinvent kind of a new way of modeling my body because another important thing to pay attention to when you're creating parametric guitars is you want to use as little features in your timeline as possible. You want your timeline to be as efficient and short and small as possible so there's less chances of things breaking. So what I did was I created three planes at different heights and then I projected different portions of my sketch. Let me show you here different portions of my sketches to those planes. So that way I basically had different levels that I could loft together. So it was one sketch and then there was three sketches that were just merely projections from that sketch. And then I created one additional one. So let me bring up all of these sketches at once. I created the original one, a projection, a projection, and a projection. And then I actually created a 3D sketch in this case, which you might not be able to do in your design, just connecting these for rails. So that way I could do all of the rails in one sketch. Thankfully, these were just straight lines. So that is fully constrained as a 3D sketch. What that allowed me to do is it allowed me to simply loft from the bottom to that middle section of the core, then extrude up that middle section, and then loft the top. And I had pretty much the entire body other than this little funky front section modeled and ready for me. Now if you remember from my previous videos when I originally designed this, I did three point planes and a really complicated like sweep and loft across the whole thing. This is just such a much cleaner way to do it and if you can make that workflow work for your design, that's a great way to do it. Um, if you're just doing a simple extrude or something then you've got no problems here. So let me hide these sketches. So then I trimmed that off so that way I didn't have to create those, you know, crazy planes to split the faces, etc. I just extruded a little bit extra on the ends and trimmed it off so that way I had the core shape of my body in place. Then what I did was I added a fillet here because I wanted that curved, but with that curve I had trouble making it parametric. So I added that later. So my sketch is actually a sharp line. But I just added that curve later so that way I had kind of a tangent, nice clean transition into there. So then I went ahead and I swept the main part of my neck. So I created a neck profile down here at the end of the fretboard. And instead of defining the end of the neck, I actually just swept it down the neck. So for example, it stays the same shape, it just travels all the way through and connects to the body. What this allowed me to do is it allowed me to have that line right there. That line right there was really hard. It's a 3D sketch. I didn't want to have to create it. So by just sweeping this right into the body, I was able to get that complicated line, which I could then use for other geometry. I then split the face of my neck. So that way I had two separate sections that I could draw lines to. And then I created my trim sketch. Now this is a sketch that tells my body where I want to trim these lines. So if you look at it from this direction, this would be the swoop of the contour, and this would be the swoop of this little horn. So then I split those bodies right there, like with that line, and then I split this one with that line, and then I created a new sketch for the top section, and I split that with this, so now that's its own. And then I went ahead and deleted all of those surfaces, 
and then I created a little plane right here so that way I could actually loft most of that horn so my loft didn't have to do so much work. And then I went ahead and reverse normal and then stitched that to the body so that way I could patch the rest with G2 curvature. So that way this face right here, I could make G2 curvature to that face. I could make this face G2 curvature to that face and the rest kind of just fall where it is. And then I stitched everything together and I had a really nice clean transition on the back of my neck. Now, as you'll notice, this timeline is pretty short and I basically already have most of the guitar modeled except for the headstock. But there's a couple troubles we're gonna run into a little bit later, especially when we start creating the headstock that's gonna create some problems for us. So then what I went ahead and did, I extruded this little piece right here so that way I could generate some tapered planes to cut my body into a through neck design. And I then extruded basically a little thin piece here that I could use as a drop top. And then I combined those two, or I created a little veneer, and then I combined them with the body. So that way I now basically had a drop top. And then I removed that surface with an intersect, um, not an intersect, with a cut. So I removed that top section of this body that I had already lofted and just allowed these two top drop tops to show. And what this allowed me to do is it allowed me to create a drop top without having to cut all the way through my neck because I had already created this as a unibody design. So I was able to separate out basically just that portion of the top without affecting my neck. And I went ahead and created a few planes. So you'll see right here, I have one, two, three, four. Those are the planes right there that I'm going to use to split this into a through neck design. Now let's go ahead and talk about why I'm using a through neck design in this. Because really the way I see it, there's two good ways of making a parametric guitar that is gonna be pretty reliable. It's either a through neck design or a bolt-on design where the neck uh, transition is not flush with the body. And the reason why I say that is the actual best way to do this, in my opinion, is being able to model the neck entirely independent of the guitar body where you don't have to project anything from the guitar body. You can just draw the neck, make it, then draw the body, make it, and add a joint and connect the two together. That way, Nothing on the body is dependent from anything on the neck and nothing from the neck is dependent on anything from the body. That will be the most stable and that's very similar to like a Fender style guitar where the transition on the back of the neck is not smooth or flush with the body. However, that's not what I wanted for this guitar. I wanted a very nice smooth transition and I found after doing testing that if I created like a set neck and I tried to make this surface match with this surface, etc., then I ran into a lot of stability problems. So instead, by modeling basically everything as a unibody design, and then I could just grab two planes and split the rest of the body, then that's very easy for Fusion to calculate. It just calculates the rest of the timeline and then splits it across those planes. And that creates a very stable um, parametric guitar. So I could say 25.5, or 24 and if I change these values to let's say 7 it's just getting wider but it's still splitting the guitar along the same plane so I hope that made sense basically if you want a smooth transition I recommend doing through neck if you want a bolt-on style I recommend trying not to reference anything in the body when you're trying to design the neck so the next thing I did was once I had that set up, I went ahead and started creating the headstock. And unfortunately, I had forgot to include a little shelf for the nut. So I just offset that front face for a shelf for the nut. And then I created a plane at angle. Um, I believe this was a 30 degree angle from that front edge. So that way I could split off and delete a little bit of that section. What this allowed me to do is it allowed me to establish where the start of the transition should be and where the bottom of the transition should be. So I didn't have to create any extra little helper surfaces or anything along this bottom section. So for example, if I bring back my headstock outline sketch, 
my headstock outline sketch is connected directly to the surface of the neck rather than having a gap here like I've done in previous videos. What this allowed me to do was basically patch that surface and then extrude up a little section so that way I could establish the sides of the headstock. I went ahead and patched the top and then I used this front face to create a little sketch that allowed to give that gave me a perpendicular plane to whatever angle this headstock is at right now. Um, that proved to be really difficult, but being able to create a perpendicular plane to this compound angled face, which is kind of hard to do in fusion, is really important if you're trying to do a multi-scale headstock. So this sketch just projected in that line, created a perpendicular line straight up, and you'll notice that the theoretical center line of the guitar is this red line right here. But as we change this scale lengths, it rotates. So right now, if it's a single scale length, it's perfectly aligned with center. But as it rotates out with a compound angle, you'll notice that falls off of center. And that makes it difficult to create your sketches that allow you to connect the neck to the, trans, uh, to the volute. And so this gave me the ability to then create, delete that surface, and then create a plane that was perpendicular to two lines. So I created a plane that had the center line and that line that I just drew selected, which is a plane that's perpendicular to my headstock face. That allowed me to draw the side profile, essentially, of the guitar. And I was able to draw that little arc right here. Now this arc, um, a member of my Discord named Mattia helped me out with because I was getting some stability problems. He extended that arc out a little bit further so that way we didn't get any trimming problems later on when we tried to split the, the, the back face with the volute. So then I went ahead and swept that surface. So I took that arc line right here and I swept it along this trajectory. And that allowed me to create a plane that is perpendicular. Once again, let me kind of look at it from this angle. A plane that is perpendicular to our headstock face. And then I can go ahead and split that sketch with my volute. And then I can delete the extra area. And now I have an area that I can basically patch and loft together. So I created one additional sketch, which was a line right here that defined what I want that transition to look like going from the neck to the top of the volute. And then we split that face in two. So that way, when we change the scale lengths and the headstock starts rotating, our lofts don't kind of flip direction on us. So by doing that, um, that way it helped out a lot. And then I went ahead and lofted. Let me pull this up real quick. So we lofted this little section right here. And then we patched the other side with G2 curvature. And then we deleted or hid that. Let me hide that one. And then we patched the other side. So this is very similar workflow to what you've seen in my other headstock transition videos. And then we stitched everything together. Now at this point, I basically have the guitar modeled, except I don't have, you know, the little veneers on the inside and I don't have the tuner holes. So now it was time to take care of the tuner holes. So what I did was I opened up that that a little sketch that I made um, on the headstock outline, and I projected in that tuner hole placement that I drew. And then I went ahead and just extruded it. Let me, there we go. I extruded that through the, through the headstock right there. And then I created a linear pattern. So let me open up this linear pattern. And I just said, I want the distribution to be spacing. And I made the distance between the center point of each one, one inch to be consistent with my formula from earlier. And then I made the quantity, my string count and the direction, this little line right here, you'll notice is from my headstock sketch. It's that line that went across that we dimensioned with that formula. I just made that the direction. So that way, as I change my string count, it adds an extra hole, exactly one inch from the last one down that path that we selected. Then all I did was just some more superficial stuff. So I went ahead, I wanted to, you know, add some veneers or, or little inlays or anything in the middle of the guitar neck. So I created a few planes. 
created four, four planes right here that I wanted to split that neck with. And then I went ahead and split those bodies rather than split face so I could apply separate appearances to them. And then I went ahead and just did a little bit of tidying up of my model. And that's essentially, I know <laughs> I kind of rushed through it, but that's how I created this model. Um, I had to reinvent some workflows and I had to get some help from my Discord members. But really, the, what you have to think about is what parts of the guitar do you want to expand or contract? What parts of the guitar need to stay fixed at all times and should never change shape? Those things you want to lock down with dimensions and constraints. The other ones you might want to use splines so they can distort and twist. And at every single stage after you've created a new feature, you want to test parameters. And if they don't work, you want to go back and find a new workflow that does work. And this took me about six months to really arrive at this refined workflow where everything is pretty much reliably stable across the board. I can change the parameters to just about anything I want as long as I move gently up and down those numbers. And I've got a ridiculously good model now. So I am really, really happy with how this turned out. And I hope you guys are too. Um, I know I didn't go into enough detail on some of these things to really answer your questions. So if you have any questions regarding how certain features of this work or how you would adapt it to your design, please leave a comment down in the description and I will do my best to answer them or better, even better, join our Discord server and post screenshots of what you're running into and either I or many other talented CAD modelers will try to help you out.